Last but certainly not least is uh, Karina Zigarakis, one of my, uh, my mentees I'm uh, proudest of, uh, doing great work at Stanford. She was a force to be reckoned with at UCSF, uh, tremendously powerful in the operating room as well as in research. So uh, Karina, look forward to your talk. So thank you very much, Chris and Vidat. It is an honor to be back here and wonderful to see so many faces, so many familiar faces. Um, it is officially over six years since I finished UCSF residency, which is very exciting. Um, and time really does fly. Um, so today, um, I'm going to try to be brief because I think this is the last talk and it's been a long day of lectures and yesterday as well. Uh, I don't want to interfere between people and their drinking, especially in Vegas. Um, but Chris has asked me to talk about some work that I do. So I do a lot of QI work. I'm our physician improvement lead for Department of Neurosurgery at Stanford. Um, and in particular, I've done work uh, doing enhanced recovery after spine surgery or ERAS protocols. Um, so I'm sure most of you are familiar with ERAS. Just a raise of hands. Who has an ERAS? at their hospital. Okay, perfect, great. So pretty much everyone is familiar with it. Um, here are my disclosures, which aren't relevant to this talk. So basically, ERAS is incredibly common. If you look at PubMed, there are thousands of results, and these continue to increase every year as people are publishing more and more about it. Um, and in terms of where ERAS actually comes from, it dates back to the 1990s in Europe. And they started doing ERAS for fast-track recovery of coronary bypass patients. And they found that when they did preoperative education, early extubation, methylprednisolone, um, as well as um, a bowel regimen and other accelerated rehab, they were able to have these patients stay in the ICU and get out of the hospital faster. And you know, similar to one of the things that Chris was pointing out earlier when they've been looking at a lot of their data from the ISSG and looking at the ODI and the outcomes for these deformity patients, um, of only a very small portion of these outcomes is coming from the actual surgeon, right? So it turns out that many things that we are doing for the perioperative care of our patients really do have um, big impacts on their outcomes. So there was um, early work in the 1990s um, in the um, GI world. They found improved recovery after laparoscopic colectomies. They were able to decrease their stay after sigmoidectomies um, using multimodal rehab and epidural analgesia. So this uh, really picked up in the early 2000s. There was a group of European academic surgeons who met in London, and they created the first ERAS study group. Um, and what they and really what was behind this was that they surveyed surgeons about their perioperative routines and practice patterns and found that this differed significantly across all centers. Um, and furthermore, that it was these perioperative routines rather than the surgery performed that was associated with outcomes. Um, so this was one of the first ERAS protocols. It was developed for colonic resections, as I mentioned. This was one of the first areas. And the key aspects of ERAS are they focus on optimizing preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative aspects of care. So there's a lot of tenants that are very similar across all types of surgery. Preoperatively, we're focusing on things like nutritional optimization, cessation of smoking. Intraoperatively, things are very important, including multimodal analgesia, um, maintaining, um, uh, maintaining euvolemia and fluid balance, minimizing drain placement. And postoperatively, these are really focused on early mobilization, removing drains as soon as possible, early return of bowel and bladder function. Um, so there was a meta-analysis of over 2,000 colorectal surgery patients across 16 RCTs, so randomized control trials, pretty good data, um, showing an overall 2.2-day decrease length of stay with ERAS. So since then, um, ERAS has expanded into nearly every single area of surgery, um, including some of our more heterogeneous types of surgeries, which include neurosurgical, cranial, and spine procedures. And so as I mentioned, these core principles um, are that ERAS protocols are multimodal perioperative care pathways that are designed to achieve early recovery after surgical procedures. You want to maintain preoperative organ function, reduce the stress on the body during surgery. And really importantly, these involve many departments working together. So sometimes as surgeons, especially neurosurgeons or spine surgeons, um, we're not, we may not always be that good at working in a team. And we have to realize that it is a team of practitioners that are really needed, nurses, dietitians, 
physical therapists, anesthesiologists that need to help us to take the best care of these patients. Um, and so what ends up happening with these ERAS team meetings, they can be a lot different from when you're doing a strict um, research protocol in the sense that you have teams, you meet, you start a protocol, you get audit, you, re you reassess, you change the protocol, um, and it's kind of moving in real time. So why should we think about ERAS in spine surgery? Um, so there's significant variability in practice patterns. I thought that Dr. Bourbon had a really interesting point earlier when he said that, you know, variation in the way we do things is good. And I think there's certainly some validity, there's certainly validity to that. Um, but when they surveyed 20 pediatric spine surgeons on just what are your practices to decrease surgical site infections, they were actually only able to reach consensus on one item initially, which is basically that you should provide some sort of irrigation into the wound, right? So we're talking about even very basic things. I'm sure we all know, and as residents, we learned this, and we try to memorize you know, Ames likes this, Mumineni likes this, right? You know, very specific things. Um, does, you know, the Vanco powder, does it go in the bone or not? How many liters of irrigation, what antibiotic goes in it? There are so many differences from surgeon to surgeon, and there's really almost no data proving that one way is better than the other. Um, so there are increasing number of uh, ERAS protocols that are being used in neurosurgery. And interestingly, most of these happen to be in spine surgery. And when this recent study looked at neurosurgery perception of ERAS, so they surveyed a bunch of surgeons and they found you know, small response rates, but 58% said that they had some type of ERAS at, this ho at their hospital. I'd say here probably my guess was maybe 40% of folks raised their hands. Um, half of these were occurring at academic institutions. And interestingly, all of them were using ERAS for spine cases. Um, uh, nearly 70% reported that ERAS was a multidisciplinary team effort. There were reasonable satisfaction rates with the um, ERAS protocols, but there were a lot of unanticipated challenges. Integrating in the electronic medical record system, very importantly, agreement of details amongst the different stakeholders, including uh, different surgeons, and then um, lack of uniform implementation of the protocol by all the surgeons, and sometimes lack of adaptability by the multidisciplinary staff. So this is a fairly recent systematic review of everything that's been published with ERAS protocols in spine surgery. And there were 19 studies that ended up meeting their inclusion criteria. Overall, these are showing improved pain scores and reduced opioid consum consumption post-operatively, but not significant differences in length of stay, complications, or readmissions if you look across what's been published in the literature. So essentially, we have a limited cohort of studies at this point pretty low quality to moderate quality evidence for the most part that's suggesting that ERAS and spine surgery may provide reductions in complications, readmissions, length of stay, and opioid use, uh, but in combination with uh, significant QI efforts for our patients. So I'll talk about two experiences that I had. The first was when I was a fellow at Johns Hopkins. So this goes back in time quite a bit now, uh, back to 2017 when I arrived. Um, and Nick Theodore, my mentor, said, great, this is perfect. Um, you do this QI work. So you're going to come up with an ERAS protocol for us and we're going to implement it. So I said, great, sounds awesome. Uh, the first thing I realized was that at the main campus, there was no way that all the spine surgeons were going to sign up for one ERAS protocol. So I went to Nick and I was like, he's like, okay, okay, we have the satellite hospital. I, we do our smaller cases there. So lumbar lammies, posterior cervicals, et cetera. There's only one other surgeon there. Um, so let's just try a little mini subset of ERAS at this hospital called Bayview. Let's see how it goes. And then maybe the other guys will buy into it. So the other surgeon there, you know, token agrees to participate, although never really ends up participating in it. He tells the PAs and residents to write different orders for his patients. So I do my literature review, come up with this consensus. We've got great support from the nurses, uh, one of the nursing leaders, administrators from the neuro ICU. We have these meetings a couple times a month and we come up with our protocol, which everyone by which I mean the nurses, et cetera, and then Dr. Theodore agree to. Um, we, we put this into an epic order set, uh, which actually ends up going live during my fellowship, which in and of itself was um, pretty, um, pretty miraculous. Um, and then we had some follow-up over a year out to look at the outcomes for these patients. 
Um, so in terms of what we did preoperatively, we did patient education and we actually started an inpatient spine class. So one of the nurses who had been a spine patient herself uh, taught this. And so we were encouraging all patients to come to this to learn about surgery beforehand. Uh, we updated our Hopkins spine surgery booklet that we provide to all patients. Um, as many folks in this room do, we encourage smoking cessation. Uh, we developed a collaboration with a specific neuropsychiatrist who had a clinic one day a week within our spine clinic for neuropsych screening because we all know that we have significant um, comorbidities, anxiety, depression, and other psychiatric disorders in our chronic pain spine patients. Um, we checked hemoglobin A1C, albumin, vitamin D, and iron and put in a nutrition referral, although we realize that this doesn't necessarily solve long-lasting problems. We did MRSA screens, and then we also collaborated with an anesthesiologist um, to do preoperative opioid weaning on patients who were on high-dose opioids preoperatively. We referred them for physical therapy, so this concept of prehab for patients that we subjectively deemed to need it, um, and then standardized our chlorhexidine wipes and preoperative diet and bowel prep. Intraoperatively, um, we tried to note not place any Foley's for patients with surgeries expected to last less than three hours, did a dose of gabapentin and Tylenol in the, in the preoperative care unit, standardized antibiotics, Decadron, the local anesthetic, um, one gram of vancomycin powder if we were using implants, an antibiotic wash, betadine dilute 50-50%, and using Duramorph as well at the end. Postoperatively, these patients got their Foley uh, DC'd by post-op day one at 6 a.m., one dose of post-op antibiotics, early mobilization, a regular diet for everyone except for ALIPS that started on clear liquids, heparin 5000 BID on post-op day one, multimodal pain regimen, and potentially one of the most aggressive standardized bowel regimens I have ever seen that also included tap water enemas. So just to show really quickly, we realized that in order to get this done, you have to have a super easy order set. So this was given to all of the PAs, uh, APPs, and residents. This is the preoperative um, order set and clinic that we would put in. Um, and then these are our postoperative order sets. And you can see the multimodal analgesia postoperatively, Tylenol, Tramadol, Gabapentin, um, and then the very aggressive bowel regimen. So looking at this data, um, one of the um one of the Hopkins med students went back and did a retrospective comparison, uh, matched 97 of these ERAS patients to 146 relatively well-matched controls. These were ACDFs, posterior cervical, lumbar decompressions, lumbar discs, and some small posterior, posterior lumbar fusions, and found that overall um, MMEs, or morphine mill equivalents, um, used on postoperative day one were lower um, in all patients, as well as in opioid-naive patients, um, and overnight PCA use was lower, but obviously we weren't prescribing them PCAs, so that might have been part of it. Um, so really what I learned here in this, um, in this project was that there are significant diverse practice patterns across all surgeons. I think everyone in this room knows that. It can be very hard to obtain buy-in from different surgeons, um, and so we really weren't able to agree on this standardized protocol across different sites. Um, there's also many different members of the team that you need to actively engage if you want this project to work. Um, so for example, we hadn't necessarily effectively engaged all of the APPs and residents. So a lot of them were still using other order sets that were easier for them to use that they were used to using as opposed to using our new order set. And as I mentioned, one great guy, very nice surgeon, he did not buy into this at all. And he just told the residents, keep on doing, you know, you do me, um, don't do this ERAS order set. So I think that is very common and can happen in a lot of places. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that when you have um, similar types of uh, standardization efforts or ERAS efforts at your institutions. And then I think really importantly, especially because we're talking here about complex spine for most of these cases here, this was a, um, you know, much of what we do in spine surgery can be very heterogeneous. And so this one particular order set that really addressed one type of surgery is probably not going to work for all the different types of spine surgery. So I took some of these lessons to Stanford and I get there and basically in my first year, uh, division chief John Ratliff is like, hey, you should do ERAS here. I'm like, great. Um, so 
This was a very different experience. So at Stanford, there is a lot of work at the institutional effort on quality improvement. So they have a lot of different programs. So they're like, you're gonna, we're gonna put you through this program. It's called RATES. I'm sure Ka Callie's probably done this, but um, it stands for, I forget what it stands for, but something through team empowerment. So essentially they have these classes and they want nearly all of their faculty to do them, especially ones who are interested in QI. And they put you together with a team. Um, usually the topic that you're gonna work on has been predetermined. So in this case, ERAS 1.0 at Stanford had happened a few years to me getting there. And so now they were like, you know, we're, we're not really doing it now. We need to, we need, it needs a refresher. You're in charge of ERAS 2.0. And you're going to be working with these folks who turned out to be awesome. Um, Oh, sorry, going back. So Jacob Drown, who is our neuro, um, who's, who is the uh, nursing lead on our neuro floor, and uh, um, an anesthesia um, instructor, um, our head APP, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but was fantastic on the neurosurgery inpatient side. Someone from patient education, Jana. You're going to work with a few of our quality consultants uh, from the administrative side of things. So this included Aaron and Sylvia. Um, and they provide you with these, this classwork every two weeks. You go and there's a curriculum. And so you learn some of these tenets of how you're supposed to address and think about fixing these quality improvement issues. And so this was definitely a lot more systematic, made me realize a lot of the reasons why, you know, our first effort at Hopkins, great effort, had some successes, but also what are the reasons for, you know, why it wasn't necessarily sustainable and leading to long-term outcomes. Um, so yeah, realizing improvement through team empowerment, that's the name of it. Um, and um, it was actually, you know, very, very informative and I learned a lot through that. So this was what I was, so first, my first task was figure out what we actually did in ERAS 1.0. So they basically sent me these and I'm looking at them and there's like a gazillion things on this list. And if you actually talk to our APPs and the outpatient, our residents, really, no one really knew if any of this was even being done. There was no system, no way for it to be done. Um, and there were supposed to be all these different types of surgeries. There were supposed to be things being done in pre-op, intraoperatively PACU, but there wasn't really any way of enforcing it. So um, I spent some time figuring out what had been done over the last several years, what was still being done, and what were some of the reasons behind what wasn't being done. Um, we built this team that I spoke about, kind of looked at the literature at that point. So this puts us to 2020. So, you know, some more work being published on ERAS. And then... Um, worked. So this was a plan. This was going to happen at our main campus. This was being mandated. Everyone was getting on board, neurosurgery and ortho. Um, so this included all attendings. And so uh, Serena Hu here, who um, obviously many of you know used to be at UCSF, is the ortho spine division chief. So she basically gave the mandate to her faculty that they all needed to, to sign on to this. So we started, and on the, in the preoperative uh, phase, we worked on several components. These are two of our APPs who helped out with this. So opioid screening and optimization, here's our smart phrase, uh, really importantly has been bone health. And I would say that this is probably the one area where the ERAS work, what built out of this ERAS work has turned out to be something that is really uh, transformative for our group. Um, so Andrea Fox is a PA who was initially hired by the orthopedic surgery department to own the bone. Um, and so when I first uh, started at Stanford, I remember my first osteopenic osteoporotic T10 to pelvis. I told my APP, I was like, great, we're going to prescribe this. I got, I, I'm emailed Crystal, got the information um, and thought we were off, you know, off to the races. Well, as it turns out, there is a lot going on in the, in, you know, in the, in the bone building world, right? There's a lot more than just Forteo and Timlos. There's, you know, a lot of our patients are very sick and have a lot of medical issues. So there can be a lot of contraindications to certain medications. Um, Avinity or Romosuzumab has also been FDA approved um, in 2019 and is another option, which is a once a month injectable as, a one, as opposed to a once daily. And these patients really do need like long-term bone health management 
maintenance. So, you know, after they're on their Forte or Timlose, they need to go on another maintenance medication. So it is really good if you have someone that can help with that because that can actually be a pretty significant workup. There are quite a few red flags and there's a lot that they really should be doing long term. So it's turned out that Andrea has been that awesome person for us. She's heavily, heavily utilized by the entire ortho and neurosurgery department. So her schedule is really booked, uh, but she's the person that we now send all of our patients to um, uh, both preoperatively and postoperatively for optimization. So that's come out of this, and I find that to be probably one of the most powerful things. Obviously, we ask them about smoking and alcohol cessation, weight management. There could be a whole nother talk on that, especially, I think, with the new medications like Azempic, Wagovi, and Manjaro that are out on the market. Um, that was not available at this time. And then um, hematology um, optimization as well. We created these preoperative education videos. I'm not gonna show them to you. They're pretty nice, but these are ones that we share with our patients now, preparing for spine surgery, how to log roll, how to put your brace on, how to get in and out of the car. Um, so these are videos that we share with patients to help prepare them. Um, this is our multimodal analgesia protocol developed by our anesthesia instructor. You'll see it's very similar to what you mo you're probably familiar with. Lyrica, Tylenol, and cyclobenzaprine in the preoperative care unit. Postoperatively, Lyrica, Tylenol, um, Oxy, um, as well as some other agents. Um, I'm not going to show you the 81 pages of the EPIC order sets, but what we ended up doing was realizing that one, you know, one standard protocol for all spine patients is not going to work. Um, and we also wanted it to be something that our resident, that would be very easy. We realized our residents and APPs don't want to have five different order sets that they need to remember. So it's all within one order set. Then you pick, was it an ACDF, a posterior cervical, a lumbar lamy disc, a thoracolumbar fusion, or an ALIF? And within that, they all break out. Um, and then most things are auto-checked, um, including a standardized post-op multimodal analgesia, standardized Foley removal, antibiotics while the drains are in place, standardized DVT prophylaxis, more on that, braces, PTOT, mobilization orders, bowel regimen, and diet. Um, our goal was to increase adherence to an ERAS uh, postoperative pathway from 45 to 80% in all our neuro and ortho spine, surgeon, uh, spine surgical patients by the end of the year. Um, and importantly, we kind of looked into why are people not using the ERAS 1.0 sets, right? So if you're trying to figure out, you're working on these QI efforts and you've put in a lot of uh, time and effort into them and trying to figure out why they're not really making it, you have to figure out why are people not using them. So the residents told us that it was specific attending preferences, um, as well as personal preferences of the residents, and occasionally patient preferences or patient allergies that led them to not do some of the, um, quote, standard orders. So um, this was us just figuring out what are the reasons why people would not, would not use certain order sets or not um, adhere to certain protocols, um, including you know, taking too much time, having too many order sets available, and then as well as this variability that we talked about that we're all that all leads to inconsistent post-operative um, order set use. So we worked on standardizing preferences amongst all the spine attendings. Um, sometimes this is easier said than done, but we did get initial buy-in for every component component of the protocol that all nine surgeons agreed to. Um, and then we also did pre and uh, post implementation surveys in order to see how this order set was uh, being used. Um, and I mentioned already some of the things that we all initially agreed upon, including antibiotics while the drains are in place. So interestingly, we were able to get um, consensus between the ortho and the neuro surgeons on everything except for DVT prophylaxis. So the orthopedic spine surgeons actually do not do any chemo prophylaxis. Um, they just use... Um, they just use mechanical prophylaxis. And for the neurosurgeons, all of us wanted it. There were different time points at which people felt comfortable, ranging from 24 to 48 hours. There is not great data in the literature. We agreed on 36 hours, but what I will tell you is that my understanding from the residents is that each attending does something different um, in the several years since this has come out. Um, so we are not really truly adhering to that. Um, 
We did a lot of education to make uh, both the APPs and the nurses on the floor aware of this order set so they understood why they needed to get our patients out of bed. Um, this works really well on our floor, on our neuro floor that our nurses are familiar with. And because our hospital has been super full, especially during the pandemic, um, our patients end up on, un on different units all over. So I will say that that's another thing that's disappointing. You spend all this time teaching the neuro nurses and then your patients are on a different floor and they have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so great news, we can get all of our residents and APPs to use the Epic or to use our EROS order set. A key here factor here is deleting all the past order sets. So they were basically forced to, so they use it really well. Um, and lessons learned. So I think really importantly is build um, in the importance of a multidisciplinary team. Um, I'm also going to put a plug in here that it's really important to have leadership from the top, uh, kind of talking about the importance and why you need to do this. Because otherwise you're in a situation where you're kind of hurting cats and people just are not going to buy into it. Um, I think it's easier to build an EROS when you have some of the QI infrastructure that we have at Stanford in this framework, um, in particular because then when you're getting towards the end of your project, you focus on the sustainability. So how are we going to continue to ensure that this project is maintained? Um, I want to say that consensus is very hard to achieve and maintain okay, um, across multiple spine surgeons. And then this was an example of how we have um, within one general protocol, some very specific ones. But I think obviously, for example, if you're doing a ton of T4, T10 to pelvises, you might want to have one that's specifically built for those patients, uh, which is not necessarily within this. And I wish that I could show you this amazing data since we have started looking at our data that this has big effect on patient outcomes. That's, you know, we don't see that. Okay. And I think that 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 probably speaks to, um, you know, I think it speaks to the difficulty of QI work. Um, you know, we talked about whether or not variability is a good or bad thing. Um, there may be some cases where having variation in, in the way surgeons do things is very good. And obviously, it's also a way that we can be innovative. Uh, but there probably are some things when it comes to, for example, our um, you know, our SSI prevention measures, et cetera, that are probably better when they're standardized across the board because then the whole team knows when to do them. Or for example, if you have a standardized DVT prophylaxis that all of the that every attending has signed onto, it's much more likely that the residents are gonna remember that because now what I've noticed is that all of us do different things. And so sometimes it's like post-op day, you know, I'm still at the 36 hours, but sometimes it's post-op day three and a patient isn't on it, right? And unfortunately that comes from the fact that the residents are not using the auto check box because everyone is doing something different, right? And so I know that we all know that those are situations that we find ourselves in. Um, and there may obviously be some patient um, specific reasons why you don't want a patient on DVT prophylaxis, but a lack of standardization can lead to, to problems there. Um, I don't think that, you know, taking all of the ERAS data, you're not going to see these super compelling, you know, significant decreases in length of stay. Um, but, you know, as, as many of you know, these are available at your institution. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from ERAS experiences like this, as well as other QI efforts. Um, this is a great. Um, this is a great reference from the Spine Journal in 2000, published in 2021. That's a great consensus statement of some pivotal points of spine ERAS protocols. Um, I'm happy to share that with anyone. Basically, the main finding here is that when you look back at the literature, all the evidence is low to moderate at best. So we don't have great RCTs um, or really high quality evidence to support these. Um, but granted, despite that, the recommendations of the expert group are very strong that we should be doing all of these. Um, so uh, in conclusion, EROS protocols have been used widely in other areas of surgery, especially colorectal, with decreased length of stay and improved outcomes. Uh, there's a lot of variability in both spine uh, procedures, uh, practice patterns, and outcomes. Um, so I think that spine surgery is a really promising area to implement these ERAS protocols. Um, and there is an increasing prevalence across multiple hospitals, academic and non-academic across the country. Um, I think these consensus guidelines are a really good um, reference for anyone who's considering doing a project at their institution. Um, the verdict is still out on specific things like epidural, spinal analgesia, um, awake surgeries, um, expiral, which we don't have at our institution anymore um, due to various issues. Um, but I'm happy to chat with anyone at any point. Um, and thank you again for having me.